was Judith Coppell, and I was a passenger on the SS St. Louis. I was only 14 months old. I was born in Germany in 1938, and I was in Berlin when they had the Kristallnacht, or the, or the night of falling glass. You see, when the ship landed, my family and I, this was my mother, my father, my grandfather, and myself, chose to go to France because it was not occupied yet by the Nazis. And we were, I felt safe. And I was a happy little child until one morning there was a knock on our door and it was the French police. And why were they there? They were there because we were Jewish. They arrested us, my mother, my father, and myself. And they took us to a camp. It was a determined camp, I believe. The name of it was Gurs in the southern part of France. One evening, my father came in and whispered something to my mother. Oh, my mother had been pl playing with me and she looked so sad all of a sudden. And she said, Judy, Judith, I have to tell you that da mommy and daddy have to go away. But I want you to be a good girl. And after that, my father came in and he said, Judy, let's go for a walk. And my mother gave me a kiss on the cheek. Bye bye. And so we walked in the darkness somewhere. And all of a sudden, there was a, 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 an office or a house. It was the headquarters of the Ose, who um, ha were trying to take out as many children as possible. And there I was, holding my father's hand. And he said, look over there, Judy, look over there. There was something that, uh, that was interesting to a four-year-old child. And here I'm holding his hand, and I looked, I looked at whatever object it was, and I heard my father saying, Judy, just a minute. He let go of my hand, and when I turned around, my hand was taken up again by someone else. I never saw my father or mother again. They were taken on a, on a train to Auschwitz, and they were put to death. All my life, I had the feeling that I was going to be abandoned. When I went back to, they, they took me back to my uh, home where I was, where the landlord took care of me. And they became my mother and father. And they loved me. And I was so happy. But Every once in a while, I would say, when are my mommy and daddy coming back? There was no answer. I felt that uh, I, I was going to lose even my French family, which I did in 1946 when the war was over. I was put on uh, a ship, the Atos de. We sailed from Marseille to America. I didn't want to go. I remember my, mom, my French mom taking me uh, to the office of the Ose in Paris. And she was holding on to my hand. I was holding on to hers. And, I, and she had to let go of my hand. And I was begging, please, please, maman, please don't abandon me. That was the second abandonment. We sailed on the ship to the United States, and I met my aunt and uncle for the first time. Um, as I grew up in America, I wasn't allowed to speak any more French. I wasn't allowed to sing any more French songs. It was forbidden. I wrote to Maman, and the letters were torn up because I had to uh, cut off uh, any ties that I had with them. And I, uh, 
I, the way I grew up, I was, I was always depressed. I, had, I was always frightened. There was a lot of fear in me. I uh, decided to go back to France after 46 years. I saw my French mom for the first time in 46 years. She was living a very modest life, no hot water, and uh, walk up. She was a very brave lady during the war. She risked her life for me so that I could live. But she was so sad, I'll never forget the look in her eyes. I decided to, um, I decided to, to um, have her honored by Yad Vashem. That's the um, a Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. So two, two years in a row, I was able to go to France after 46 years. Why weren't you allowed to speak or sing French songs anymore? And why did you have to like cut off your adopt your, the landlord and his wife? I don't know. All I know is that I was very sad that I was taken, that uh, I, uh, France was completely cut off from me because I love being in France. Um, I am French myself. I have a French family. I was born there. And it's, it's wonderful to hear this story. And I, I mean, I can't, if, if it wasn't something, it's something, if you ask any of my friends that I talk about a lot, and I, I just wanted to say that it's, so horrible to hear from you that you weren't able to celebrate any of that culture, any of that heritage. But that I'm, I just wanted to. I thank wanted you. to become Catholic. <laughs> I went to I went to uh, to school with them, and I went to church. Celebrated all the holidays. It was wonderful. So I became an interfaith minister, by the way. Oh wow! Later, yes. <laughs> What made you decide to go back to France after how long, I don't remember how long you said, but like 40 something years? Um, I was, I went to a um, conference for hidden children. And I remember at a luncheon, there were uh, 22 people on the stage. And they were, uh, they were saviors. They were people that had saved Jews during the war. And I cried and I cried and I said, Maman should be there. I used to call her Maman. She should be there among the, two, three, the 22 people. And um, I decided I would call her up. I had, I had her telephone number from her, her granddaughter. So I called her up in France and with a very broken French, I said, Maman, thank you for saving my life. And I want to see you. Can I come and see you? And she didn't speak English, and so she said, Mais oui, ma chérie, viens. But yes, my darling, come to France. And two, two months later, I was on an Air France uh, uh, going to, Par to first to Paris and then to Pau. I was wondering, um, when you reunited with your French mother, or met her family did you were you able to ask her what made her accept you and save you she as a small child why she was she it was the christian thing to do yeah. it was the thing for her to do she raised she um risked her life and the whole family's life in, if I would have been found out, you know, the Nazis did get did come to our house, and I, I remember her putting my hair on top of my ears because she because she was afraid that they would know I was Jewish. Uh, yeah, and and also she said, "Don't speak," because I had a German accent, and one of the soldiers said to me um, afterwards. You are such a pretty girl. You look like your mommy. And I went over to Mama, and, she, and I told her, you know. And uh, I said to her, you see, Mama, you're really my mother now.
I myself a partner there who wore a Gestapo uniform. His name was Ludwig Kronenberg and we were crawling in under the barbed wire into the ghetto, which took us a good night, the whole night to get there. And we were able to um, get out a few uh, people out of the ghetto in Lodge and bring them to Warsaw. But after a very short time, one of our members proved to be a traitor. He was a Gestapo informant and we were all arrested. We were all arrested and uh, Ludwig Kronenberg, my partner, was executed. And my paper somehow held up to the scrutiny and I was sentenced to nine months imprisonment for sympathizing with Jews as a German. They still didn't discover I was Jewish. I was sentenced to nine months in prison for sympathizing with Jews. When I came out, I discovered that my parents didn't want to go into the ghetto, so they left Lodz when the ghetto was established, and they went to the city called Tomaszów Mazowiecki, where my grandfather was the cantor of the city, where my two aunts were teachers. We had friends, we had relatives. Uh, this was our town. And um, my parents put, got me back on my feet and they thought that they escaped the ghetto, but it didn't take very long before the ghetto in Tomaszów was also made a ghetto. In every city in Poland they made ghettos. And the small villages and towns around are surrounding the towns had to move in, the Jewish population had to move in. We had to absorb them. Epidemics spread and starvation spread and people were dying like flies. And we had no luxury of funerals. When somebody died, the dead body was put out on the sidewalk. Now uh, we uh, wanted the ghetto to function because our parents survived World War I. And they said that war is hell, but it ends. And when it ends, you go back home. So this is what we were hoping. The war will end and we'll go back home to our life as we knew it. So in order to survive the ghetto, we needed to function. Schools were forbidden for Jewish children. So we had illegal schools in the ghetto. I had a school in my house, school, you know, a few children. So in any case, um, that's what we had, illegal schools. Then we had a little hospital. We had no medication, but there were doctors and nurses that were trying to help people. We even made a Jewish theater to give people some more morale to, to survive. And then uh, the big ghettos, like ours was a little ghetto, we were just 15,000 people. But, uh, but the big ghettos like Warsaw and Lodge, there the Germans were emptying the ghetto by sending people to the east. They used to say that they're taking people to work in the east. So, uh, it wasn't, you know, nobody minded to go to work. The only thing they started worrying was that nobody came back from the East, that they didn't get letters from there. What's happening there? They needed to know where they're going. So now those young runners, like my brother and his friends, were put on trains and sent by regular trains followed the other trains to check where they were going. And they discovered Treblinka, Sobibur, Helno, and other dead camps. And when they came back to the ghetto and told us that the Germans are making concentration camps where people are being gassed and burned, we didn't want to believe them. The Germans? The most cultured nation in the world? They're killing people by gassing and burning their bodies. <laughs> In November of 1942, and a shooting started around the ghetto. And when we heard the shooting, we knew that we had to be in our room, because whenever there was a, a, anything happening, you had to be in your place, a raids or anything. And we ran through the streets of this ghetto, and the bullets were falling, and people were lying on, on the street dead. Saturday morning, they decreed, decreed that the ghetto will be divided in half, as you heard it was only 15,000 people, and the first part of the ghetto, let's see the southern part of the ghetto, is to come to the marketplace, which was the selection area, 
uh, and uh, to go through a selection. And anybody who couldn't come, who was too sick, too feeble, too old, too young, was to be put on a chair in front of the building. Nothing alive was to be left in the building. Even some people maybe still had a cat or a dog, even those animals. They were Jewish dogs and Jewish cats. An assessment was dispatched and he shot on the spot. Everybody who sat on those chairs, everything was killed on the spot. They started on Saturday with one part of the ghetto, rested on Sunday, and Monday they took the second part of the ghetto. On Saturday I lost my parents and my older brother, and Monday I lost my in-laws, including my little Ruti who was my student in my school. And finally those small camps became obsolete and they put us on trains and they sent us to Auschwitz. And on arrival at Auschwitz, we knew already about concentration camps, we didn't even doubt it anymore. But still, to arrive at Auschwitz and to see it was such a horror, I cannot even believe that, that it really existed. And uh, we had to jump up. First of all, uh, uh, those creatures in striped uniforms uh, came up on the train and made us jump off the train. And on the platforms, we were immediately separated, men separate, women separate, anybody under 12 and over 40, straight to the gas chambers. We were marched up to the camp proper. And when we were marching to the to um, Birkenau, and I saw the chimneys and the this pure just flames and flames and ashes were flying and you could feel them on your fingers. Those were human ashes and I said to myself, I have to survive. I'm strong. I need to survive. The world has to find out about it. This cannot be forgotten. And this, work, this was working on my adrenaline. This is why I did survive. I went through so much later, but I did not give in. So we arrived, the first stop was a building about a room of this size where we were stripped and we had to go to the next room where they shaved us. The next room was a, a disinfecting bath and then they took us uh, to a third room where they threw at us clothing. We got just dresses and shoes. We did not get underwear, we did not get uh, uh, any uh, stockings or, or socks, nothing, just like that. When we came out of this building, it was evening, it was night, we didn't recognize each other without the hair and in those terrible rags that we were wearing. People were crying and milling around and just crying, not recognizing each other. And the SS women were beating us with whips to form a marching column of five abreast. When we arrived, there was no room for us in Auschwitz. So they took the girls from the Czech camp and gassed them. So there was room for us. We got in the Czech camp. But later, in November of 1944, when the Hungarian um, uh, influx came to Auschwitz, they needed room for them. So they gassed all the gypsies, all the gypsies, in one night. Elie Wiesel was one of them that was in the former gypsy camp. And then there was the twin camp, where Dr. Mengele kept twins for his experiments. He made horrible experiment of those twins. Most of the twins, if they survived, one survived and the other didn't. Still during when the Germans were losing the war, the priority was still killing of the Jews, not the war effort. Killing of the Jews was the priority. Finally, we arrived in Hamburg, Alton. I heard about Hamburg before. I was chosen to work in the kitchen. And the next morning is roll call. Roll call, Jews on the left, non-Jews on the right. I had to stand roll call in the kitchen because that's where I worked. So I went on the left and my Yugoslav girl was on the right and she said to me, are you crazy? Come with me. They don't know that you are Jewish. Stay with me. And this saved my life. I later found out, but I didn't realize that at the moment. 
and we were traveling for a couple of days and the trains were bombed and, and, and the SS was jumping off the train and pointing their machine guns toward the train. That's how we were traveling and after a couple of days we finally wound up in Denmark. When we got there, the two SS men, they were always escorting those trains, put their knapsack on and they said to me, now you are going to be free. What's going to happen to us, God only knows. And off they went. And there were Danish people who came to the train to pick up their relatives. Himmler made a deal with the Swedish Count Volker Bernadotte. They started with picking up uh, Scandinavian prisoners from the camps and then wound up made a deal that some of the Jewish prisoners would be given passage to Sweden and um, they took us on those ferry boats and in Sweden they put us on Pullman trains, regular trains and it was the 5th of May of 1945 it was a nice day, the sun was shining I sat on the bench on this train the window was open and a man peeked in and said Shalom and we jumped Shalom? Are you Jewish? Are there Jews alive? And the Jews walking on the street, he says, oh, well, I'm the, the rabbi uh, in this city. This way. <clears throat> the rabbi who later married me. And there was a group of Polish Christian girls in the corner of the wagon. And one of them got up and came running to us. I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish. I just had false papers. Yeah. So when she heard the word Shalom, she just absolutely uh, uh, couldn't contain herself. Well, in any case, that's how we arrived in Sweden. I, I, I just didn't want to have children, but after the miscarriage, I, I got, you know, Mother Nature take over. I wanted a baby so badly, and my son was born. He was the prettiest baby in the world. And then 15 months later, my daughter also. And those two children gave me a reason for being. The only thing, I never spoke about the Holocaust. The reason for me surviving was to speak about the Holocaust. In spite of everything, I'm a, a, a real optimist. I hope that there are more good in people than there is bad. And that I think that if I reach some young people and teach them that of course we are different, but we learn from one another's differences. The difference is wonderful. We cannot judge somebody because prejudice is prejudging. We have to learn to respect one another. You want to be respected, you have to give respect back. And this is so very important for me. When I speak to young people, and I see in their eyes that they got it, that they get what I'm, what I'm here to do. Because somebody said to me, do you want them to hate the Germans? I said, this is not my goal. I don't hate them. I, I know that there were Germans who were decent. I am the last generation, one of the very few last living witnesses of the Jewish Holocaust. Now, guys, think about that. You're looking at somebody my age, I'm a grandmother, in a few years, that's it. You're going to read about it and we're going to be a footnote in the history books. My stolen childhood can never ever be restored because I was never allowed to be a child. Eventually, I became the adult, the parent the person who never had the luxury of knowing what having a family, what having parents, grandparents, other relatives was like. Hatred is a very powerful word. Imagine being hated simply because of your religion. What was life like for someone who was hated so much and that because of this hatred, most of her entire family was murdered? What becomes of a little girl who survives a ghetto in Poland and death camps in Germany? 
By age five, Frida was thrown into a world of hatred, fear, starvation, and total aloneness. The last time that I ever remember using the word mama was when I saw my mother with my baby brother on her arm being herded into a cattle car. My baby brother, Shimek, who was 18 months old when he was stuffed into a furnace. And the only time that I ever remember the last time was when I saw my mother being herded with my baby brother and I was screaming after her, Mama, because I thought I should be with her. They were, I didn't know where she was going. I must have been three, four, about four years old when, and all of a sudden the, the door was just burst open and there were troops, soldiers, uniforms. I don't, I don't know whether they were Polish or German or, or what. Dragging my father on these cobblestones just and right up to, to the gallows because it was a hanging gallow and hanging him. And I remember my mother putting her hand in front of my eyes and one of these uniformed people, whoever he was, knocked her hand away and said, she has to watch, she has to learn. And I learned, I learned a lot. It's the middle of January, 1945, again herded back onto the cattle cars, back onto the train. It went to a place called Bergen-Belsen in Germany. But to say that very few people survived that, it was disease, it was shootings, it was starvation, it was every kind of horror that you could possibly think of. But there was this tree, and I fell in love with a tree. There was nothing on it. It was bitter cold. It was ice and snow and mud. But I remember I uh, enticed one of, another girl to, to dig and watch as people were being dragged, watch as they were just falling apart. But I knew that I could not go back into that barrack because that's where people were dying. That's where they were with all kinds of dysentery, whatever it was. But I knew that I somehow had to stay outside in that hole eating picking bark off a tree and eating that. And then one day, I had no idea what, how, what, what, what the lapse of time was, but it was a very different, it was a very different kind of day and it was strange. It was a lot of noise and there were trucks and there were, well, again, I didn't know what a Jeep was, but, but there were all different types of of trucks and, and other vehicles, and there were, again, people in uniform, but I didn't know, and loudspeakers and in a language that I didn't know. And I got scared because it was a uniform, and anything in uniform meant beatings or shootings or death, and I ran to my hole, and I wouldn't come out. I have no idea how he convinced me, but he brought some other people who spoke different languages and convinced me, and it took, it took some time, it didn't happen in one day, that he was not going to hurt me, that I was okay. And of course, he was one of the ones who said, you're free, the war is over. I, I, <laughs> I, I had no idea that I was fighting anybody, that I, I had no idea what those words meant, but he convinced me. And then one day, uh, the, the, the people that were working in this displaced persons camp said that since I had no family and I was an orphan, that I was going to be sent to Sweden for adoption. And being, <laughs> being the person that I was, I said, I'm not going because my uncle is coming for me. What uncle? Who uncle? I don't have any, I, I had no idea what I was talking about. As the camps were being liberated by either the Russians or, or the French or um, 
the British that some, somewhere or other they were posting lists of survivors. And somebody said to my uncle, wherever they were, that, that oh, they just liberated a camp in, in Germany called Bergen-Belsen, and there's a, a few little girls. The very next day after that happened, I was out wheeling a baby that was born in the displaced persons camp, and I see a man walking toward me with a trench coat and a hat. He came over, and I remember walking up in, in Polish, asking him if he was from Poland. He said, yeah, there was no way that anybody who had known me uh, a year or so before that, two years before that, would have recognized me. Anyway, and he said, yes, he was from Poland, and then he walked away, and he went into the cottage, and as soon as he walked away from me, it was like a light bulb or something, and I knew that was Uncle Bernard. He had no clue to ever look for me because there, it was not a possibility that a little girl all by herself would have survived. And then so they weren't looking. It was very, very difficult, but we ended up in a Belgium, uh, in Brussels, Belgium. I was nine years old before I ever stepped foot in a classroom. Picture yourself all of a sudden that you are Jewish and you're living here and all of a sudden you can't go to school, you can't uh, go to the movies, you can't go to the mall, you have to wear an armband. How do you think that would make you feel? Um, I would feel that I'm not accepted, that who I am um, is a problem to society, so I think I would be affected emotionally. So if I was persecuted like the Jews were before they were put into ghettos, um, and I wasn't able to go to school. I wasn't able to get an education at all. I couldn't do any of the events with my friends. I couldn't go to dance school or whatever it was that I wanted to do. I definitely would fight back and I know it would almost be suicide. I can't imagine what it would be like to have all these restrictions, like to not be able to go to school, to have to uh, distinguish myself from other people. Was there one particular exhibit that you will, that really made you think about something in your life? Um, I think it was the exhibit um, with Anne Frank, and I feel very close to Anne Frank. So when I went inside the exhibit, I was overwhelmed with emotion. So I, um, I did see some other exhibits that got to me. Like there was one exhibit with the shoes. Uh, the shoes. The shoes. And what did it mean to you? How many people, uh, or at least a fraction of how many people had died there. It represents uh, what we have left of the time, uh, or the Holocaust. Shoes, it's like a lasting memory. The one thing I'll always remember, the transit car that, where people were packed into them for deportations. The box car? Yeah, the box car. We went inside? Yeah, I went into it. It, it, just, it just felt extremely ominous and it made me really uncomfortable standing in it. It was really dark and there was just one shred of light coming in from the slits in this tiny spot on the wall that could barely be called a window. And people suffocated in that car. How long did you stand, spend in there? I spent a minute or two standing there and just taking it all in. Most people spent two or three days if they survived. Can you imagine that? No, I can't imagine. Um, when I went into the museum, um, I saw a thing that really personally affected me, and, and that was an oboe. And it was an oboe of a person who died at Auschwitz. Um, and I remembered my sister, and she plays the oboe. She's 12 years old, um, and she also has a disability. And I think every time I remember that oboe, that she could have been the one who, during the Holocaust, could have died. Was there any other thing in the museum that, that you'll always remember? The room with all the pictures going up and down the walls. Which, describe what that is. A picture of like families or people in the town just covering the entire walls of like a tower. All the people um, 
in the pictures had been taken to concentration camps and I think they all died. You spent some time with uh, Frida Jaffe. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. It's quite an, uh, an honor to be able to meet one of the last sur uh, survivors from the Holocaust. And to, like, she's one of the last generations that we'll ever see. And to know that I got to hear her story from her, from her herself, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. After going to the Holocaust Museum, I really found something inside me, and it really, it changed me as a person. You know, it really made me think about other people and always be kind to other people. Because one kind move that you make towards somebody else can act as a ripple effect and help other people in a bigger picture. And you can't stop evil, but maybe that one act of kindness can help.